This is Sarah Sands. She's a mum of young boys. And this is her just after she'd stabbed her neighbour, Michael Plested, eight times. Well, the man she killed was known as Michael Plested, but he changed his name to try to hide his past because he was a convicted paedophile. Plested had targeted Sarah's boys, Bradley, who was 12, and his 11-year-old twin brothers, Alfie and Reese. On November 28, 2014, a mother of three named Sarah Sands stabbed her 77-year-old neighbor Michael Pleasthead eight times with a kitchen knife, before letting him bleed out inside his apartment in London, England. The real reason behind that seemingly cold-hearted murder left everyone in shock, and it quickly became a case that left many people divided. In 2014 the 32-year-old Sarah and her three sons moved into a flat located in Silvertown, East London. Sarah, her 12-year-old son Bradley and her 11-year-old twins Alfian and Reese hoped that this would be a fresh start for them, without knowing about the monster lurking in their neighborhood. Opposite of where the family lived was another block of flats, inside there lived the 77-year-old Michael. He seemed to be a sweet and lonely old man, who was working at the local news agency and everyone in the neighborhood got along with Michael really well and trusted the man. Michael was always nice to everyone and people would stop by to talk with him and so Sarah also met Michael and quickly became close friends with him. She thought of him as a nice and friendly old man, without realizing what kind of monster he was and that she would stab him to death just months later. The two would regularly chat with each other and whenever Michael needed something, Sarah was happy to help. I genuinely thought he was just a lovely old man. I would watch him on the estate. Pleased to see everyone, help everyone. Everybody, you know, said hi to him. He was easy going, always had something nice to say. Yeah, he was just a nice man, absolutely no red flags whatsoever. I cooked for him, looked after him, always kept him company when I had the time. At some point Sarah's oldest son, the 12-year-old Bradley was searching for a small job suited for his age in order to earn some extra money. Once again the seemingly helpful Michael offered the young boy a small job at the newspaper agency and Sarah and Bradley gladly accepted this offer. In reality this job offer was nothing else than a predator, seeing a chance to find his next prey, but Sarah trusted Michael since she considered him a good friend. She also trusted him because she was aware of the fact that other young boys from the neighborhood had also worked for Michael to earn themselves some pocket money. This fact always seems particularly disturbing to me, since Michael treated these boys who had worked for him before as some kind of resume to appear more trustworthy. In reality he basically was showing off a list of his past victims and unfortunately Sarah's sons would soon be added to this list. So he asked my twins to help him clean something, it was a carpet, to help him clean the carpet. Bradley was incredibly excited for this opportunity to earn some money and he even brought along his younger twin brothers from time to time. However Bradley soon told his mother that he didn't want to work for Michael anymore and the despicable reason for this decision would soon come to light. In November of 2014 the younger twins finally broke and told Sarah the whole truth. After they had helped Michael to sort out his newspapers, he invited them back to his apartment, where he would groom the young boys. When Sarah confronted Bradley with this, he also broke down and began crying before confessing that he had also been abused by Michael. But he had been too scared and ashamed to admit it and now he was blaming himself because he felt responsible for what had happened to his younger brothers. From the get-go Michael had just befriended Sarah in order to build trust with her young sons in order to eventually abuse them. Being confronted with the truth Sarah felt incredibly guilty, since it was her job as a mother to protect her children from any harm and she felt that she had completely failed her boys. The family contacted the police and explained everything, which led to Michael getting arrested but sadly this isn't where the story ends. Michael pleaded not guilty and was released on bail and even worse he was even allowed to move back into his old apartment just across the street from his victims. This was obviously terrifying for the young boys, since they were scared that Michael would seek revenge against the people who reported him to the police. Sarah was furious and instantly returned to police urging them to arrest Michael again, but they denied this request and advised her to move. Police, of course, straight away, called the police, called my family, they advised me to go to my mum's house. Um, while they investigated, they obviously knew straight away who he was. I didn't still at that time. He was investigated. Yeah. He yeah. was charged, but he was yes. he was released. He was given back a bow. Home. Yes. So he came back onto the estate. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then talk us through what happened. So because he came back and got bail, we had to continue staying for safety reasons at my mom's. In the aftermath of Michael's murder, many people said that she should have let the police and the courts do their job. That's what she did at first, and they returned the man who assaulted her kids near them and told Sarah that she had to move if she had any problems with Michael living in the area, a textbook example of failed justice. Since none of them felt safe in their home anymore, the four of them moved to her mother's house for a few days. And even worse Sarah received the news that since Michael had pleaded not guilty, her sons would have to attend a trial to give evidence against him. This is possibly the worst nightmare for any victim of such a crime, being forced to not only face your abuser but also to relive your trauma by describing it in court. Understandably Sarah felt let down by everyone and that no one was listening to her, she couldn't believe this injustice and that Michael was still a free man. On November 28 Sarah had drunk two bottles of wine and went back to her apartment. After looking at some photos of her boys, she once again felt guilty for the pain her children had to experience under her care, and then this guilt slowly turned into anger. She grabbed a 12-inch knife from her kitchen and went over to Michael's apartment block. There she was captured on CCTV entering the elevator. Sarah arrived at Michael's apartment and knocked at his door, after he let her inside she demanded that he would do the right thing and confess to his crimes, so that her children wouldn't have to take the stand during trial. Michael stated that her children are lying and tried to act like the sweet old man he was always portrayed to be. However when he realized that Sarah wasn't believing her at all, his personality finally shifted and his evil true nature was coming to the surface. He became cocky and began to smirk, showing no remorse for his terrible crimes against Sarah's children. Enraged by his despicable behavior Sarah then pulled the 12-inch knife, Michael panicked and Sarah began to stab Michael a total of eight times. She then left the severely injured Michael behind and left his apartment. Jumped out of his chair, went over to the window and then came towards me. I think I had the knife in my left hand and I remember him trying to grab it and then I remember leaving. The CCTV footage shows Sarah leaving the scene with the bloody knife still in her hand. Michael slowly bleeds to death on the floor of his apartment, probably feeling agonizing pain until the very last moment of his life. An hour later Sarah went to the police and turned herself in and stated that she lost control. She was arrested and charged with murder, while her children were put under the care of her grandparents. In the aftermath it turned out that Michael Please Ted was just a false identity and that he had been convicted several times for sexually assaulting young boys from 1970 to 1991. The shocking total of 24 previous convictions for assaulting a minor, makes it even more baffling that the police didn't realize who they had in front of them. However Michael used a legal loophole in the United Kingdom that allowed convicted sex offenders to change their name, passport and driver's license. A more than stupid law that made it easy for Michael to hide his criminal record and enabled him to get close to young children. This was before the sex offender list was created and the police in Silvertown seemingly didn't bother to check his fingerprints when he was arrested, after being accused by Sarah and her children. The most disturbing part about this is, that the apartment Michael was given by the council, was literally overlooking a primary school. This legal loophole was exposed in the aftermath of the crime and hundreds of cases like this came to the daylight, where sex offenders simply changed their name and never informed local authorities about it. Sarah's trial began in September 2015, where she explained her situation and how she lost control. She stated that she only acted as a mother, who wanted to protect her children. The judge acknowledged this case as exceptional and took in account all the horrific acts Michael had committed. In the end she was charged for manslaughter by reason of loss of control and convicted to three and a half years in prison. And this is where people began to be divided. Many people saw her sentence as far too lenient and wanted it to be extended since they viewed her actions as premeditated. Evidence for premeditation in this murder were her decision to wear concealing clothes, her attempts to wipe any fingerprints from the murder scene and that she never called for any help. Condoning what she did because you, you can't take the law into your, in, into your own hands. She should have allowed justice to sort of take its place, which was happening. Sarah was found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. But then this wasn't considered tough enough and it was doubled by the courts. She appears to have attempted to avoid 
her fingerprints being left at the scene. She did not call the emergency services. In the end her sentence was doubled because of these circumstances, but today she is free again after serving four years of her prison sentence. Many people in the community praised Sarah for what she did and called her a hero for protecting her own and other children. In later interviews she stated, I have no pride in killing him but now I at least know that he cannot hurt anyone else. I am not a bad person but I did a bad thing and I never denied that I should be punished for it. I don't regret what I did, I was a mother simply desperate to protect my children. I usually never condone someone murdering another person, but I think this is a somewhat rare example of vigilante justice carried out in a somewhat good way. Who knows how many children she spared from a lifetime of misery, and how many lives she actually saved. She rid the world of a true monster and imagined how many kids and parents got justice knowing their abuser was gone. The only good part that came out of this entire situation is that it had brought attention to the fact that these people were able to just change their names and start over. So not only did she avenge her sons, but possibly saved countless other kids from letting it happen to them. I want to end this video with a statement from Sarah's kids and how they as the victims feel about this case. It does have more of a sense of security, because you don't have to walk down the street thinking, you know, if he's, he's going to come around that corner. Yeah. Yeah. And he literally lived across the road from us. Well, I mean, I mean, I could see the man's house. I could open yeah. that window over there and I'd see his house across the road. Yeah, if he was in prison after 24 convictions, then we wouldn't be sitting here today.